Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Peter Robinson and today I've got Harsh on from Push Protocol who's going to tell us all about Push. So Harsh, please tell you tell us a little bit about yourself and then please present your slides. Well, first of all, thanks Peter for having me. Um, really, really excited to be here. Uh, it's a bit weird because I have two monitors. So right now I'm looking at the camera, but not looking at you. Uh, but yeah, uh, really excited to be here. I'm Hirsch, uh, founder and project lead of Push Protocol. What Push is doing is building this Web3 native communication layer. And we are going to deep dive into all of it and why it's important and you know how we are doing things. So let me just share my screen and we can get started. Uh, cool. Uh, hopefully, you guys are able to see my screen. Yeah, I can see them. Uh, awesome. So, Web3 engagement and messaging, that's what we are going to deep dive on. And why push plays this crucial role in fundamentally changing the Web3 landscape. Uh, and why it's important. So, let's get started. First of all, we need to understand, like, why do we care? Uh, and the best way I can put it out is we care because a billion user does not equal a million devs. And let me explain what I mean with that. Like devs are just like you and me. Uh, what we do is we look at the code and we try to crack it. Uh, we actually are in it for the tech. We go deeper no matter how abstract the documentation is because we want to do cool things, right? And that's our job. Uh, but when it comes to users, right, they are a different story altogether. Users are actually not in it for the tech. Uh, they are in it for the product and the features and how that those features make their lives 10 times easier, right? For example, we are all users of Zoom right now. That's how we are doing the meeting. And Zoom is a real-time communication protocol. But we don't know how that operates, and that's okay, because we use Zoom for, our, for the feature it provides. And of course, before Zoom, the very fundamental thing that we did, which led us to, to this meeting, was create a Google Calendar invite, or create a page where then people can just say that, I want to be here for this meeting. And what Google then did was send a notification out at the right time, so we knew where we want to be. And this is how Web2 operates at a scalable and at a global level, wherein notification drives all the communications that we do. Which brings me to the next slide, which is that everything starts with a notification. So just think about it. What was the first thing you guys did in the morning? Well, most of us, we got up and we had a look at our phone. And uh, on our phone, what we saw was countless notifications from all the Web2 apps that we use, wherein these Web2 apps are saying, hey, something of importance might have occurred to you for you, and what do you want to do? Uh, for example, uh, Slack would be sending you messages or notifications about some work-related things, but it's just not related to work, right? Whether you are doing any payments, whether you are doing any Amazon delivery, whether you are doing any PayPal payments, or even you are doing any gaming or even socializing, all of it is relying on notifications. Like when your Twitter post goes viral, uh, Twitter sends you a notification. When you're talking or chatting on WhatsApp as well, WhatsApp, you're not chatting on WhatsApp as much as you're chatting via notification on WhatsApp. And that is how critical notification has been for Web2. And of course, we are very happy that Push got the chance to invent notifications for Web3. And that has uh, already started changing the landscape as in how people interact. But how do we do that? Uh, well, in essence, we created this decentralized communication protocol that enabled any DAP, any backend, any smart contract to send any form of communication starting with notifications, whether it's on-chain and off-chain. Uh, and what Push did was that when the protocol sends these notifications out, the Push nodes, they basically index those notifications to your wallet address, uh, very akin to how Ethereum indexes your financial data to your wallet address so that any crypto wallet can then tap into the network and can, in a secure way, show you those transactions and allow you to make new transactions in case uh, uh, 
uh, you have the private key. Same thing with push. Because this is a network uh, and communications are tight, you are able to, or any protocol is able to send notifications. It can also be off-chain, like when this uses push for off-chain notifications. And once those notifications are validated, it is tied to the network with a verification proof. So any crypto wallet can just tap into the network and can just show these notifications out to you. Another example by which you can understand it more properly, like why Web3 related notifications, right? So think about it like this, like whatever we are doing in Web3, uh, we just have two participants. We have this protocol that we interact with. And the only way we interact with this protocol is a wallet address. So the protocol only knows your wallet address and the history of the wallet address, whether you are taking any loans, whether you are doing any governance, whether you are doing a L1 to L2 transfer, or simply sending crypto out or doing anything social. All of it, you are not doing, your wallet address is doing, right? So if ENS wants to send a notification out, they can only send a notification out to that wallet address saying that, hey, your ENS domain might be expiring. And it goes even bigger, like, if you go to uh, social or web free social, or if you go to governance, everything that the protocol knows about you is your wallet address, and therefore that's your web free username. And therefore, communication needs to be tied to your web three username so that the protocol can finally come and engage you. Just how web two apps they know that something of importance for the user is about to occur, and they come and engage. And that's what push notification or push did uh, for the notification landscape. Uh, of course, we also bought notification categories because you need to take care of your users. You don't want to send notifications that are not in, uh, interesting for them. And we also made sure that this is a opt-in only protocol, uh, which essentially means that a protocol that wants to send a notification, they first have to come and opt-in or create a, uh, or activate their protocol on push protocol, which is what we call a channel. Once they have created this channel, other wallets uh, can come in and opt in. And once they have opted in, the wallet uh, or the protocol can send a notification out to them. Uh, all of these right things or right steps that happen, everything is validated or signed uh, by the wallet address uh, using uh, signatures. So EIP 712 signature, for instance. And because of that, whatever push is doing, all of this is immutable because the content that is getting signed by the user is what is getting uh, validated and stored on the push notes. Uh, and of course, uh, along with that, we have categories. So you are able to send notifications based on your user preference. And uh, yeah, shout out to Shapeshift, uh, uh, Arbitrum, Lens, Snapshot, like we are working with all of them to enable Web3 related notifications. But yeah, that was about notification, but that was just the start, right? What we wanted or what Push wanted was this to be this de facto Web3 communication layer uh, for all the Web3, not even just uh, Ethereum or EVMs, but for the entire Web3. Uh, of course, you know us from the name Ethereum Push Notification Service because that's how we started, uh, but now we are Push. Uh, but yeah, coming back after notification was the next best thing that the Web2 world offers. Uh, well, that's socializing, right? That's messaging. Whenever you're talking, uh, on any platform, you are essentially talking via messages, like let's say WhatsApp or let's say Twitter or any other platform, like even a gaming platform, you're talking uh, or you're chatting on that platform. And that's what Push also thought that we need to bring after notifications because uh, we really, really closely follow the web two world. And in web two world, what happened was notifications was invented by Apple, then came WhatsApp. And then of course, after that came FaceTime. And this is what uh, uh, was the path that push followed. So of course we created chat, but we also knew that when we are talking about chat, chat is essentially engaging between friends. And we knew that, you know, 
why would a user switch from web to chat like telegram to web3 chat uh, of course if you are on a platform it makes that much more sense to do a web3 chat but more than that what we realized was that web3 chat will shine more if you are able to bring web3 native features into the chat itself and that is what pushed it by introducing gated group chats uh, which is in a way uh, able to combine your web3 wallet uh, on chain data or characteristics with your uh, chatting ability for example using push you can create gated group chat experience where you can say that uh, create this group which uh, can only be joined by people who have xyz tokens or a amount of nft or b an amount of poaps and because everything is cryptographically done and the verification proof is generated all of a sudden you have something which is decentralized autonomous groups uh, kind of like a play on dao wherein people who only have those things connected to the wallet can come and chat uh, and you can even take this further like you can define a condition for joining a group and define a condition uh, for sending a message out <clears throat> and once you do that uh, all of a sudden you have this new way to form communities that really are about talking uh, about certain passion or certain uh, uh, things that they like for example you can create a group of ethereum uh where then people who hold certain amount of ethereum can come and only talk and now all of a sudden people who are just talking about ethereum uh they know that other fellow people also hold ethereum or you can create a group that has a uh, board ape nfts and now you can negotiate with fellow board ape people if you're uh, going to get your nfts traded or you can do it with dao or you can do it with almost anything that you can imagine and that creates this new experience for web3 that is not possible on web2 and that is why we are really really excited about it what's more uh, push has been recently adopted by unstoppable domains uh, which basically means that all these gating experience or all these notifications they are also available on uh, unstoppable using push and that also made sure that you know communities that are maybe in 5 years in web3 they can also have a group and they can chat so that's something very very exciting that we did uh, and of course as i spoke about like after whatsapp uh, the next thing that we wanted to do was to bring this real time communication uh, which is wallet to wallet uh, uh, the wallet to wallet video calls or even wallet to wallet spaces and that's what we did with push spaces and push video uh, and again it unlocks this new paradigm wherein you can gate spaces so that only developers are able to speak in the spaces and the group chat functionality or the gated functionality kind of governs everything and uh, yeah in a nutshell that that is what push did uh, and also to also we need to understand that this is just not for wallets uh, it can also be used in nfts as well because nfts are kind of moving through web3 social and with push what we also have is not just wallet to wallet communication but when we are saying wallet uh, we basically mean wallet standards uh, which essentially mean that nft standards are also supported and as i said like when we were talking first the vision of push is to be this communication layer for web3 and that basically means that we need to support all evm chains as well as all non evm chains uh, that's why we follow this format uh, something called keep 10 which basically mean that you don't uh, only assign or talk to the wallet by using the wallet address of course it's abstracted away but in the background what is happening is that when you are talking to a wallet of ethereum you are basically following this keep them format which is a blockchain uh, agnostic standard uh, which means that you also attach uh, uh, the chain uh, that you are talking to or the standard that you are talking to in ethereum case it's eip 155 then the chain name for ethereum it's one uh, let's say if you are talking on matic uh, it will be 8001 uh, followed by 
uh, channel address separated with semicolons. And what it does is it basically makes sure that push from the very start is compatible whenever we decide to go non-EVM as well, because all of these wallet standards are basically supported. Same thing with NFT. There is this NFT format that we have uh, come up with. And using that, you can basically ensure that you can talk to NFTs of any chain. And yeah, just by doing this, push essentially empowered or has sent more than 68 million notifications to over 175,000 subscribers and have 650 plus integrations out, uh, which is what you see over here. So this is basically what push protocol is or the features of push protocol. Now let's see what happens or how push network operates and uh, what happens in the background. So just to refresh your knowledge, I am sure all of you know uh, the difference between traditional systems or crypto related systems. Uh, but just to make sure like in traditional or web two systems, what we had was client server and we had uh, was distributed model. All of which was okay because there was this one source of truth which everybody relied on in a way. And because of that, everything worked well. But then came peer to peer, which essentially meant that anyone can run the software but of course it didn't have incentives and that basically lacked this thing where people were not incentivized to run the software or nodes. And that basically led to what we call as Web3 or decentralized world, wherein there is no network control. Uh, everyone is able to run the nodes, but when they are running the nodes, there are economic incentives to make them aligned or to reward them for running the nodes. And they are slashing incentives to ensure that malicious nodes is getting kicked out, uh, which basically was what our motivation when we started creating uh, push nodes or the push network or blockchain of communication. We wanted it to be permissionless because of course Web3. Uh, we also wanted this to be proof of stake because we loved how Ethereum moved to proof of stake and uh, how effective it has been. Uh, and of course, we realized that this communication layer that we are building, it will require multiple nodes. Uh, I'll go into detail a little bit later into it. Uh, but just to ensure that we are able to separate computation effort and storage efforts, we ensure that it has multiple nodes. And another thing what we wanted to do was we wanted to scale this network uh, in terms of making sure that communication is almost near real time, if not real time. And also in terms of making sure that the communication is able to be effectively fetched really, really fast, uh, which basically led us to create a push network. Uh, just shout out to the graph because we got really inspired by the way they worked uh, and the way they guarded the network and the way they started the network. So what was the design that we came up with uh, for the push network? Uh, well, we came up with three nodes that essentially do uh, different, different stuff. Uh, one of those is validator nodes. Uh, validator nodes, think about them as the nodes that are able to provide APIs and that are able to validate all the works. See, I already mentioned that whenever you, you're using any write API calls, all of it is signed because if you're looking at decentralization, you have to look into decentralization in two ways. One is that the content needs to be immutable so that a central party cannot uh, change the content. And second is that the content cannot be censored. So push has been doing part one from day zero, which was making sure that everything is signed by the wallet and because of that, the content that is getting uh, delivered, that cannot be changed uh, by push, even if you wanted to. But the second thing that content cannot be censored, that can only happen when you have nodes. So you are able to split or you are able to make sure that even if the content is getting dropped by another node, the all the rest of the nodes, they are able to validate those content and they are able to punish the subsequent node who's dropping the content down. And that is where validated nodes come in. Think about it more like computational nodes, 
because their job is really computational heavy. They basically validate all the work uh, that's getting done. They basically validate what notifications are coming, whether the channel that is sending the notification out, uh, that's indeed uh, uh, the signature of uh, those uh, and they match. And even when the notification is going out to a wallet or to a Web3 user, uh, those Web3 users have uh, indeed opted in uh, to that channel. If they haven't, then the notification is still is sent, but it's delivered on the spam. And same with the chat. Like if you are not connected with the uh, wallet, uh, then the chat essentially goes to the request tab, or you can even block this out because again, you need to be uh, very, very user-centric when you're designing a Web3 protocol. The second thing that we did was that we launched, uh, or we are launching storage nodes. Uh, the job of the storage nodes is to store all the data because communication will become heavy as we go forward. So essentially, the computational uh, effort, that's taken up with the validator. And uh, the storage effort is taken up by something called storage node. And their job is easy. They only listen to validator nodes. And they, in, they basically store and index the data and also reshard the data based on uh, the smart contract uh, that we have that governs the entire design. And then we have delivery of notifications, which is done by delivery nodes, uh, because in the end, when you have a notification from a wallet address, right? You might want to do certain other things uh, uh, to it. For example, MetaMask might want to send an email to the user or MetaMask might want to even use Google or Apple notification service to further send uh, that notification of the wallet out to uh, the iPhone of the user or to the Android of the user. And that's where delivery notes come in. Delivery nodes are essentially local. They are not uh, uh, part of the network, but they are connected to the network to make sure that any person or any crypto wallet or any crypto tab that's uh, listening to these notifications, they are able to also uh, put in their critical confidential data and make sure that the notification can be routed to other third uh, other parties as well, or even other Web2 apps. And then, of course, we wanted to make sure that the network is guarded, which is done via smart contracts. And uh, also, we wanted to make sure that the network is able to shard, which is also done by smart contracts. And we are going to just uh, understand like how that works. So to begin with, whenever you are going to run the network, what you have is something uh, or whenever someone wants to run the network, they need to decide what sort of node they are going to run. Uh, let's say they wanted to run a validator node. Uh, what they do is they stake uh, a part of push into the smart contract. And the smart contract uh, has this list of validator nodes. Uh, and whenever uh, it gets a stake from... Uh, any person that wants to run the validator node, it also asks for the peer info of that validator node, which helps in peer discovery. So when the validator node uh, or when a new validator node, let's say V5, wants to get into the network, they will stake push in the contract. And the smart contract essentially then says, okay, I have uh, 100 validators. This is 101 validator. So I will assign it uh, a part of the sharded network. And uh, I will make sure that uh, this peer discovery is also uh, enabled uh, or is also available for other validator nodes to uh, essentially go and talk to. And because all the validator nodes are listening to the smart contract, they now know that uh, a new validator node is available. And same for the storage node, like when a new storage node wants to come, they stake a different amount of push tokens into the contract. And once they have, uh, again, the smart contract is able to know that, okay, these these are the amount of storage nodes that I have. Another one is coming in, which means I can put some of the data 
into different replica format and some of the user data into the storage load. And of course, because that's uh, happening on uh, a blockchain, uh, that is the way by which we guard the network. And that is also the way by which we shard the network. So <clears throat> deep dive as in how everything works in detail. So the first thing that happens is that you have this push SDK. And what they do is they generate uh, those validated tokens. Uh, validated tokens basically help in deciding like what validator to go for in sending a message out. Uh, the tokens keep on changing. So the validators, they keep on rotating. Uh, once you have this validator token, what you do is you essentially send a message out along with the validator token via push SDK and push SDK figures out like what validator node to talk to because of this predeterministic algorithm. And uh, once it knows that, okay, this time I need to talk to validator node two, uh, we will send the message, whatever uh, uh, the protocol wants to send to validator node two. And at that point of time, validator node two will start accumulating all the messages that are getting delivered to it uh, for a 30 second block period, which is called as a message block. And once that message block is done or completed, it essentially asks other validator nodes to attest on it. If the attestation goes fine, then everything is delivered to the storage node and also to the delivery node, because if you're doing this last mile delivery and uh, uh, if everything works well, then yeah, the entire system works and nothing gets broken. But what happens when a validator node stops performing or the validator node turns malicious? So in this case, like everything worked well, it went to storage and delivery node, but in case the validator node one, let's say created a uh, non, uh, created a block, but validator node four said, uh, no, I don't think uh, the attestation or the signature match. In that case, the validator itself moves a report on V4 and asks for other validators to sign. If everyone signs, it gets sent to the smart contract. The smart contract will slash validator node four out. And after some amount of uh, time, it will also kick validator node four out if the validator node four doesn't perform well. But in the case, the validator node one reported incorrectly on V4, then at that time, all the other validators can sign against the validator node one as well. Uh, therefore, creating this game theory wherein uh, the validators or it's in the best interest of the validators to properly attest and move a message to the smart contract and to properly identify and move a message for a malicious node. This is the same thing that is getting followed in storage node as well. Uh, the API calls uh, come to validator and uh, ask, send me uh, all the notifications or all the messages for a particular wallet. At that point, uh, it also, the API also moves a quorum out, which can be two to six to whatever they want. Uh, shorter quorum will of course mean faster delivery time. Uh, once that happens, the validator node, they basically talk to storage node and they basically get all these uh, messaging blocks out and they verify by talking to other storage node to make sure that everything is fine. Um, but yeah, in case something is not fine or a storage node delivers incorrect information, they can go to another storage node and kind of see if the quorum matches uh, and also move uh, a reporting uh, issue on the smart contract that storage node two was probably not de delivering the uh, actual data and therefore they can be slashed. Uh, this is how the validator and the storage node slashing occurred. Reshard, I already spoke about it, but in essence, because the smart contract has the information of all the validator nodes and all the sharding nodes, uh, the, valid, uh, the smart contract can decide whenever a validator is added or whenever a storage node is added. Uh, at that point of time, the uh, contract can decide 
what shards or what storage nodes should store what data uh, along with the replicas count. And it becomes linearly scalable because the more storage node or the more validated nodes come in the picture, the more replicas and the node count goes up. Therefore, the decentralization becomes stronger. More than that, the content delivery becomes faster because nodes all around the world will mean that your notifications or messages are getting fetched even faster. Uh, so yeah, that's that's uh, the basic gist of uh, how push operates and the push storage node and uh, uh, what it does. Uh, I can also take in the questions or I can also deep dive into uh, the exact science behind uh, uh, the communication, like how we store the notifications or how we send the chat out in case you guys want to. So let's have a look at the, I haven't been looking at the chat, so I'm not sure if there are questions in chat. Uh, let's have a look. No questions in chat, which is a good, good one. So, so you you require a forum of validators to say that a a message is valid. Um, if if a validator doesn't, you know, has like got something that others don't agree happened, do they get slashed or what what happens to them? Exactly, exactly. So let's say you validated a message, you need to move for attestation of the message before the storage node can index it. And at that point of time, the other validators, they basically attest on the message. And let's say any validator found that, no, the signatures that are sent in those messages, they are not matching, then that other validator can move uh, a reporting scenario on the smart contract. In that sense, or when that happens, the validator who's moving the report out, they are also staking their reputation that, okay, Peter's validator is not working. So if every other validator attests that yes, Peter valid, uh, validator is not working, then the smart contract slashes a part of your stake token. But in case other validators disagree, then also the reporting moves forward. And in that case, the validator who moved the malicious report, they get slashed. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I think David's got a question in um, chat. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, Harsh, I saw okay. early in your in your talk that uh, notifications are gas free, but your contracts incur gas. And I'm wondering how your operators compensated for operating costs, including gas. Thanks. Okay, so this is a really excellent question, David. Uh, so when I said notifications are gas free, it's because push supports all the ways by which you can send notification. So when you are sending a notification from, let's say, a smart contract, of course, you are going to pay uh, uh, for notifications. But most of the time, what has happened is that people choose to send uh, an off-chain uh, 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 notification payload. The way they do it is that, let's say Coindesk wants to send a notification out. They basically create the notification payload. Then they sign it uh, uh, with EIP 712. And because they signed it with EIP 712, the content becomes immutable. And then they send it out to the push node. Uh, and because this is done in the off-chain uh, fashion, the push node can index it because they have the signature, they know that, okay, this wallet or this protocol actually send a notification out. But in the case of smart contracts, what happens is, of course, that when you are doing a transaction, that's how you basically emit a notification out. In that case, you do have to pay for gas. Uh, another cool thing, by the way, with uh, which is what we are doing, like these protocols that... Uh, create uh, their channels to send notification out. Uh, right now, they are doing that on Ethereum. But very soon, we are essentially 
including the ability for people to choose their base chain. So right now, if you want to send notification, you come on Ethereum to create a channel. And then you go on the alias chain, let's say BNB or Polygon uh, or any other EVM chain like Arbitrum. And you basically connect your channel with Arbitrum by making or sending a message from the Arbitrum wallet address that you own. That this is the channel I have on Ethereum. And you do the same step on Ethereum by sending a message that this is a wallet address I own on Ethereum. And because the nodes now understand that you own both the wallets, they are able to connect and your channel can send a notification in a multi chain way. But using uh, uh, Wormhole, uh, what we are uh, doing is we are uh, breaking this functionality away uh, just because we understand that non-EVM chains, they might have friction when we have this format. So instead of that, anyone who wants to create a channel, they can create it on the base chain. And uh, using Bumhole, we bridge the messaging to Ethereum. And because of that, the nodes are able to understand uh, that okay a channel is getting created on any other chain and we uh, uh, we have the channel data we have the signature so that's fine we can create the channel out so this is the next step that we are working towards uh, in ensuring that the user friction is solved uh, but yeah uh, to answer your question that's how we make sure that the notification are gas free Um, all right. Does anyone else have any more questions? So I have a few questions. Uh, see if anybody has any. Please, far away. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing uh, I want to make sure I understand it. Uh, so in push, you implement your own chain. So you've got storage and the uh, reward and sourcing mechanism implemented as a side chain, right? And there's cross-chain communication uh, implemented within smart contracts. Correct. So it's not a side chain in a way. No. Uh, actually, you can call it a side chain. Like uh, I think uh, we can call it a side chain. Uh, what is happening is that uh, the network uh, it essentially already collects the signature or already validates the signature. So because of that, uh, uh, there is uh, already a verification proof that gets passed along. Uh, but yeah, I think you can call it a side chain. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, uh, but, but you're implementing a protocol, the, the storage and the reward and slashing mechanism. You don't leverage uh, something that's already uh, uh, available in the field and uh, in the chain, right? So my question was actually, uh, could you uh, could you use, for instance, something like uh, first uh, for uh, reward and slashing, uh, something like eigenlayer uh, for restaking and so on? And uh, the second question is about storage. Uh, could you benefit from uh, uh, the new EIP for H4, for instance, posting blobs instead of the web? Uh, my question is related as well to the sort of the lifetime of the notification. Got it. Got it. Maybe you don't need to store it for. For several years, you no, started no, no. for a Make couple of weeks. So can you can you benefit from uh, some infrastructure on, on layer one? Got it, got it. So uh, two questions over here, like uh, the blob storage uh, that or protodank shard, sharding that Ethereum has. So uh, we would benefit from it if we required uh, the security of Ethereum. In that case, we would uh, put our blobs out to Ethereum via sequencer and uh, we will uh, basically test it out. But with push, that is not required because the security is already done because verification proof is attached to all the right calls. So any right call or any notification or any chat messages uh, that you are getting, there's a verification proof that you get as well. So the front end can verify that this wallet has basically initiated this uh, chat 
or this notification out. So because of that, we don't have to do a sequencer and put things on Ethereum. We can just operate as our uh, blockchain or as our network. Uh, in terms of slashing and rewards, uh, we will look into eigenlayer because there is a smart contract that's there and because there is a staking mechanism that's there. So the team is looking into eigenlayer. But when we started or, you know, we, we have been building this for two years or 2.5 years because real-time communication is very hard with blockchain. Uh, so when we started, of course, Eigenlayer was not there. Uh, but there is a chance that we can use Eigenlayer to, just to ramp up more security and more staking. Yeah, thank you. I had one last, which is about the latency. Actually, you, you mentioned it in, in you know, talk about real time and so on. So, uh, and, and I saw 15 seconds somewhere. Uh, so yes. what about uh, chatting with a 15 second lag or a, a video chat? Amazing question. <laughs> amazing, amazing question. So, uh, and that also gives me the leeway to talk how chat is implemented differently uh, by the notification. Oh, um, uh, uh, voice service notification. So with notification, like we knew that this architecture works because 15 second lag is near real time notification. Uh, what we do is like, it's a 30 second message block. We can also reduce it to 20 seconds. So maybe 10 second latency, but of course for chat that doesn't work. Uh, and that's why what we did was we are essentially launching this notification notes first. Uh, along with something that we call as a push user. Uh, let me explain like what is a push user as well. So right now we spoke about channels and how channels are created. But uh, what we also realized was or what the vision is that in the end, we are talking about a user. So while a Web3 user is a wallet address, the user, the real user are multiple wallet address and multiple NFTs combined into one. So what we introduced was that anytime people are interacting with push network, we are essentially generating a PGP key for them. Uh, PGP key stands for pretty good pi uh, privacy, and that's getting used by WhatsApp uh, as well, along with other uh, uh, standards. Uh, and what we do is that uh, once your wallet or once you are onboarded into push, this PGP user is assigned to you with a wallet. Very soon, this PGP user can contain multiple wallets. Uh, and that is something that we store. So when we are launching this notification network out, we are basically launching it for PGP user and notification. Now, when it comes to chat, that's where the PGP user becomes very interesting because what we do is that this PGP user gets encrypted by either your wallet or in case you're using NFT, then a different encryption algorithm. And when it's getting encrypted by the wallet, it is not getting encrypted by the wallet. A key is generated, that key encrypts PGP key, and then this key gets encrypted by the wallet. So because of this, when you're talking or when you're chatting or when you're sending notification or doing real-time communication, you're doing it with the PGP user, but the encryption is getting controlled by the wallet. And because this is a double encryption, you can also move to a non-EVM and have a new encryption algorithm for this key. And as long as the key unlock works, the wallet or the PGP user will be unlocked and you are able to chat. So that is something neat. It means that you are not tied to the wallet. And that is how NFT wallets also operate because NFT you cannot even encrypt with the wallet. So what we do is three way that we generate a key, then we generate another long phrase that encrypts the key. And this long phrase encrypts the wallet that holds the NFT. So the ease of use is really there when you want to encrypt. It's just a sign and you encrypt everything out. But you can also transfer this NFT because imagine the scenario that Web3 will grow. And if you are doing this Web3 social and NFT chat, you 
need to make sure that whenever you're transferring your NFT, you have this option of carrying your conversation with your friends. And that is why, you know, push NFT chat works really well with all the Web3 socials. Uh, but yeah, uh, coming to the chat part, like this is how the chat operates. Uh, uh, the real-time communication uh, operates on two ways. Like one is that uh, your peer info is generated and sent uh, via notification to the other wallet. Uh, the other wallet receives that and then uh, they can send their peer info back to you. And because now both of you have the peer info, you can we use WebRCT to connect you uh, in a P2P way. Uh, so no brokerage server is needed. But yeah, coming back to chat, uh, the architecture for chat is going to be a bit different. Again, because you have all the verification proof, the content becomes mutable. In chat, what we'll do is probably a DPoS approach wherein chat is sharded, but a node is getting assigned so that whenever you're chatting, that single node essentially is responsible for chatting uh, between people, while other nodes are kind of replicating the data that is happening or that is happening on the network. The idea is that let's say this tunnel or this relay goes down, you can switch to another relay. And because the relay has those verification proofs, you can carry on. So with chat, it's not going to be a quorum based scenario. This is what we are thinking right now. Uh, it's going to be a deep OS network uh, wherein everything is getting archived. So in case a node or a relay is giving you a problem, you can switch to another relay. And because this PGP user is sending all these payloads and encrypting all these payloads out and doing this verification proof or attaching it out, it kind of works because you don't have to rely on a relay to do anything other than relaying uh, the information from one peer to the other. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. Those were really very cool questions, by the way. Gave me a sweat as well. Ah. As I tried to remember all the things. So, yeah. Good, good questions. Are good, uh, make a good video. I often say that um, people should pretty much skim the, the whole talk and watch the question time. Question time is where all the interesting stuff happens. Um, why don't you switch to the next slide? Let's go through the next bit. Okay, there is a merch store. Um, you go to the link. If you go into YouTube and to shop, um, there's a. It's not showing up at the moment. There's a problem with the um, YouTube fourth wall integration. So, anyway, it'll, I'm sure it'll be fixed at some point soon. Um, okay, next slide. So in two weeks' time, we've got Sandra, Dr. Sandra Johnson, who's going to talk about um, the impact of going from on with stakers on Ethereum having just 32 ETH to having maybe a lot more ETH. And, you know, what would the ramifications of that be? We've then got a few more talks. The Layer Zero talk is going to be by probably the CTO, um, and I'm going to do a talk in June there about random number generation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, if you're watching this um, live, it's on YouTube. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, go to the meetup and you can join live. Um, there's also a Slack workspace that you can join to discuss this talk and others. Um Okay, are there any final questions for Harsh? No, just clapping. All right, look, thank you very much for your time today. Um, if anyone asks a tricky question in the comment section, I'll reach out to you, Harsh, and get you to answer it directly. But look, thank you for your time. Of course. Thanks, thank thanks, you. Peter, and thanks to an awesome audience for listening in. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Arsh.